I'm in Taiwan, one of the technological centers of the world. In fact, odds are that smartphone or laptop that you love had a chip built just down the road from here. And that kind of got me thinking, while we love electric cars or home batteries, we don't spend enough time talking about the subcomponent level, the industry. That's why I'm here today at 2035 eMobility Taiwan to talk about some of the companies that make those products that we all love so much possible. Whenever you hear, oh, this has 5% longer battery life or 10% better performance, that stuff happens at the subcomponent level. So let's go in here and let's see what the companies, the industry is working on and how the future of electrification is being defined. Let's go. Like, I just love this little guy. So one of the first questions I get all the time when I talk about electric vehicles and solar is how on earth are we gonna charge all those cars if we convert them from gas to electric, right? It's a good point. For example, that charger back there made by Delta is a 350 kilowatt charger. Imagine if 10 of those people plugged into those or 100 EVs, 1,000 EVs. The peak on the grid would be mind boggling to say the very least. But Delta actually is working on their own management platform to make all that easier. For example, let's say you've got solar panels on your roof. You're a big warehouse, you're a hospital, you've got a microgrid, and you build this big warehouse of solar power. Well, that's great. But how, how do you know how much energy you need? And what if you have batteries on site? How much does electricity cost? What if you could build a system all around that managed and tracked it all? There's no one charging, but there's a ton of sunshine charge the battery packs, electricity is cheap. And then as soon as people start plugging in, use a blend of solar and stored energy from the battery and reduce that grid peak. This is the future. Yes, charging cars the way we do it now with a dumb grid where nothing makes any sense probably wouldn't be all that efficient. Although I could probably still work, but with a smart grid that becomes a very easy to solve problem. By the way, they also have cool power electronics. They build entire EV platforms. Delta is one of those companies that you've maybe never heard of, but I've actually used Delta chargers. I look behind like, you know, they brand chargers, but when you open the door, look at it, oh, it's made by Delta. It's one of those companies that kind of makes everything behind the scenes. You might not know them directly, but they do. So car, entire car EV platforms, power electronics, inverters, motors, drive units, bi-directional chargers, all that kind of stuff. But what I think what's really interesting about Delta is their grid management software. So here's an example of some inverters from solar, maybe you have solar panels coming in to an inverter. You got the brains of the unit, you got batteries on board, you got chargers. This would pretty much be what a future mall would look like or a residential area or a commercial structure where you have shopping, mixed use architecture, buildings, and in such a world, it's hard to imagine how all this stuff ties in, because currently it doesn't. But in grid 2.0, in future microgrids, when we figure this stuff out better, it'll be really, really clever management that'll sit on top of all of it and make it all possible. Because yes, electric cars at 350 kilowatts is a massive, massive spike on the grid. But yes, we can do it. And they'll just take cleverness and brains. By the way, 2035 eMobility Taiwan is a hybrid show, meaning yes, it's on site here for people who can attend. But if you're curious, if you're in the industry and want to learn more, check out the links in the description. We will have a link to the online virtual show as well. Make an account and log in. You'll see they have all kinds of categories from the companies showcasing their products and services in areas like autonomous and connected or ecosystem or electric and machinery. Let's check that out. In the virtual exhibition, you'll see all the different companies showcasing their products, but now virtually online. You can even find out more information about the exhibitor, find out information about the products and services that they're providing, like here with Delta and their smart grid EV management systems. You can even schedule a meeting, contact them personally. Yes, it's not quite as cool as being here in person, but it's pretty close and they have really awesome virtual exhibitions. So this is probably a very common site for a lot of you, a bus. But what's different about this one is it's purely electric. I'm with a company called Master Transportation, and I wanna talk about how this bus is changing the streets here in Taiwan. I'm joined by Lucky. Lucky, how's it going? 
Yeah, very good. Nice to meet you, Ricky. Nice to meet you. Uh, right now, we we're inside a very first electric intercity bus, first launched in Taiwan, which can carry our passengers from the Taipei City, which is the capital of Taiwan, to the airport. Right now, in this year, we have in total 250 units of electric buses running in six different cities in Taiwan. Our battery, we choose the LTO lithium titanate oxide battery from Japan. And this LTO battery is so far known as the safest battery in the industry. And the other advantage of this battery is that we can use a fast charging system. I probably should touch that, but I'm ready to drive this thing. All right, as Lucky mentioned, one of the keys to making this bus work was their decision to use lithium titanate as the cell chemistry. So what that means is that they use lithium titanate nanocrystals instead of carbon on the anode. And as a result, there's about 30 times as much surface area, which means really, really, really fast charge and discharges. And as they mentioned, they can charge this thing from a 20% state of charge to an 80% state of charge in just 15 minutes. And their average stop is six minutes. That's about as long as it takes to fuel up on gasoline. Now, this is not perfect. There are some trade-offs when you go LTO. They're super safe, as you mentioned, super fast to charge, but they have a lower cell voltage, only about 2.4 volts, and also they have a lower energy density. But that's where a bus is the perfect application for it. This bus has enough range to go, let's say, 100 kilometers and quickly charge at every stop. And remember, this is an inner city bus. So this is an example of how just how much engineering there is in batteries. You don't think about it very much because you think, yeah, get batteries, put more of them on there, less of them on there. But your choice in chemistry has a huge impact. And LTO makes a ton of sense for commercial applications like this. So 500 kilometers a day with multiple stops to charge. And of course, no tailpipes. Of all the vehicles we need to electrify, buses are top of mind. First of all, they're highly utilized. Compared to a car that might sit in your driveway, this thing is going to be moving passengers all day long. And when you're stop and go in city traffic, this is quiet, whisper quiet, pollutes nothing, and will be a breath of fresh air for anybody who lives in cities. So this is Advantech. They work on some really interesting things like an iBus, which is basically a network protocol for in-car communication. First of all, when a new technology emerges, everyone kind of does everything. I kind of think about early days of software. When I first started writing code, it was hard. There wasn't a lot of help. But over time, people build libraries, and the next thing you know, you're just dragging and dropping and building things with ease. For example, you ever try scanning a check with your phone? Wells Fargo and Bank of America, they don't build it themselves. They license the company that builds that for them. Just drag and drop. With EVs and this new age that we're in, it's kind of the same thing. Not every single car company needs to build their own self-driving tech and sensors and make it all work together. And Vantec does all that for them. They partner with NVIDIA and Intel. And what they allow you to do is bring in your own sensors, your own cameras, and they are the heart of all of it. Plus, what's really cool is it even has a cloud backend component so you can monitor big fleets and things. This is less for your typical car like you and I might drive and more for fleet operators. And two really cool use cases that Van just told me about is mining and shipping. So mining, big mining operation machines, they could use this because they could have AI and cameras and automate older machines and bring stuff that was kind of backward or older into the modern era with better AI and better tech. This is interesting because if you can better monitor your fleet, better track traffic and GPS systems, you can lower emissions by routing better, avoiding traffic jams, and better utilizing your fleet and your assets. But this is the sort of next generation that we're seeing as EVs get more popular. It's gonna be companies that offer whole suite solutions. That way every new company, maybe you and I, we should make an EV together. I probably am not going to be able to figure out this part, but we can license it for companies like Advanced Tech. So this one is really the, say, dual system in one box. It has the Intel HAI solution with the embedded NVIDIA Ori platform. So it means two systems in one, and it can, uh, um, for you to diverse a lot of different applications. So you can see it has the tons of different IOs, 
and also have the related the best fit of a B coat uh, defined for example like cameras for example, like a uh, A or 10 of the uh, high speed camera over there okay. and uh, what people need a driver consoles for driver to interact some things frankly speaking uh, you know that the here needs to have the display signal audio signals and also power and the hockey some other things but uh, in most of cases you need many cables then that's very difficult to install and maintain all the things which are make it one cable to have everything over here one common theme throughout the show dc fast charging we're still in the early days we talked about before but look at this this is one of the most beautiful chargers i've ever seen I don't know, there's something about the design of it, the colors, and like just the layout, how a big screen. Just top notch. Okay, okay, okay. This is cool. This is an electric tuk-tuk. How awesome is that? This company is called Civilized Cars, and they build these in Thailand. So check this out. This is pure electric. It has about 100 miles of range. Sorry. It has 100 kilometers of range, and they can be configured in different ways. So this is kind of like passenger or cargo. You can even make food truck versions. How cool would a tuk-tuk, electric tuk-tuk food truck be? Sadly, I don't think they're coming to the US, but that would be so cool. Here's something you spend zero time thinking about, charge connectors. But this company literally just sells the handle for DC fast chargers. And you're thinking, what's the big deal? Well, a ton. Here for the CCS standard, this port right here, is super critical. On Teslas, there's a pin that comes from the car to keep that pin locked in. But for CCS, this is what holds it in. And without that, this cable, a live cable transmitting 250 kilowatts could slide out and who knows what could happen, right? So the engineering behind this one little cable is massive. Imagine how much, how many cycles of that this could take before it fatigues, falls apart. My friend Tom Malogny over at State of Charge he does extensive testing of these and freezing temperatures outside or drop test. What happens when you drop this over and over? Because these are in public and they're going to be abused. <laughs> this would be a super cool RV conversion. It's like just the right length and size. Why don't we have stuff like this? So I'm at the Shiling Electric booth and they're doing some pretty cool stuff in two areas. I was recently in India and now I'm in Taiwan and I realized how valuable and important and popular scooters are. We don't see that much in the US. We love our big cars, but in Asia and in Europe, Scooters are super popular and they're an amazing way to get around. The cost per mile or the energy per mile of getting people around a scooter, as you can imagine, is just so much less. So in 2022, around 6 million e-scooters were sold around the world. And about 10.5 uh, million electric vehicles were sold. So if we compare these two markets together, you can see it's around, the e-scooter uh, business is about 60% That's... of the electric vehicle business. In Taiwan, we have a new regulation, which is by 2040, all of the uh, newly built uh, scooters has to be electrified by 2040 in Taiwan. So that's why we have developed an 8 kilowatt powertrain system. Since most of the uh, scooters in Taiwan is equipped with a 125 cc to 150 cc engine. Right. If we change that into an electric powertrain system, it is something similar to an 8 kilowatt peak power. Gotcha. Yes. So that's why we use it. So 150 cc motor engine to yes. replace with this. Yes. And what's the correct. top speed on that scooter? Uh, the top speed will be 100 uh, kilometers per hour. It's fast. So I know I've been talking about electric vehicles for seemingly five or six years now, but it's important to remember that we are still on the early days of electrification. And it comes to charging in the US, it is still very, very much early days. This is a cool little level two charger of destinations and stuff. But the really cool thing is this behind me. This is a 480 kilowatt charger. And if you're wondering, are there even any cars that can charge that fast? No, no, there are not. So what this tells you is this is how you design and build for the future. If we haven't fully rolled out enough chargers yet, and we need to, let's build future proofing in mind. Otherwise, if you build to what we used to do five years ago, they're gonna be obsolete before you even put them in. And these things are not cheap to put in. And if you plan ahead, and build in future capacity on day one. You build that much more longevity and lifetime out of these things. 
really, really important. I can't wait to the first car that can charge at 480 kilowatts. Link down below, leave me your comment and your guess what you think the first car will be. Cybertruck? I don't know, some massive van, EV, delivery truck. It'll be some big vehicle that can charge this quickly and it'll be so cool to know that these are getting rolled out right now. And if you're wondering about CCS, that charge standard, there's actually a difference between Europe and Asia and North America. This is the CCS1 cable that we all know and love in the US. This is CCS2. Look at the difference, that's kind of cool. This is what they have in Europe and in Asia. And uh, yeah, kind of fun to see them side by side. So that is a quick look at 2035 eMobility Taiwan. There's only so much I can learn from behind a desk. You gotta get out there into the world and see what these companies are working on. Yes, we all love the end products, but there's so much that goes into it. We noticed with those supply chain issues in the last couple of years, how disrupted our lives can be when any part of that supply chain gets disrupted. So that's just a kind of a quick look. Cool companies like Delta building like future microgrids and grid management and all the other cool companies building buses and all kinds of electrification efforts. And I think industry events like this are things I need to be more involved in going forward because there's so much you realize and learn what people in the industry are thinking about, what problems that keep them up at night. And I think there's so much to learn here. So that was a quick look. And don't forget there is an online virtual exhibit as well. You can check out with the links down below. I'm Ricky Tuba Da Vinci. Thank you so much for watching.